Hello and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today is podcast number 1980. The topic is mindset and the title is, You Are Not Special. But that's a good thing. (laughs) It certainly doesn't sound like it when I first say it that way, but the phrase, You Are Not Special, is something I've told myself Oh my gosh, thousands of times in my life. But I've actually said it as a positive statement. And here's how. When I first started my journey, I was fat and weak. When I first started my fitness journey, it was back when I was 15 years old. I was talking with a friend on my birthday. We were kind of teasing each other. And he said, well, at least I'm not fat. And I remember in that moment, I was like, well, damn. (laughs) I didn't. If you had asked me before that, I hadn't registered that I was fat. Like, I was definitely, like, skinny fat. I didn't have, I wasn't obese, but I had absolutely no muscle. So, weighing normal with absolutely no muscle meant that I actually had more fat than I should have. So, I definitely was kind of chunky. I was chubby. I, I was fat. So, when he said, at least I'm not fat, I was like, well, crap. I don't like the fact that he can call me something that I don't want to be true of myself. So I started to work on that. So when I first started my journey, I was fat and weak. In order to improve, I had to overcome being fat and weak. What helped me overcome being fat and weak was knowing that I wasn't special. Others have also overcome being fat and weak. (laughs) Meaning it could be done and there was a way. I just had to find out what it was. So I experimented, learned a lot of things, and 25 years later, here I am. This is my job, helping other people improve their physical health and developing bodies that they're proud of. So it's been a pretty crazy ride since then. (laughs) Hopefully there's still a long way to go. But I remember that was kind of the initial thought of I wasn't special. And having it be a good thing because it meant that There was a way to overcome it if other people had done so. Getting a little deeper, when I left high school and entered college, I was exposed to a new set of people in my life. Where I grew up, everyone knew me, and whatever oddities (laughs) I had were essentially invisible at that point because people had grown up with me, and the oddities were just me. Like, oh, that's just (laughs) rough. They are just who you are. But when you're around new people, if you have any oddities, it's new for them to see. So those oddities are a lot more obvious. For example, my I'm actually blind in my left eye. One way that this shows is when scanning the room for something, uh, trying to find somebody in a crowded room, or my favorite example, because I'm old enough to remember this, is if you go into a movie rental store, like Blockbuster or Movie Gallery, and you have to scan the walls to find a certain movie. When I do that, my head shakes. Typically, when people scan for something, and they have two eyes that work, one eye remains fixed, the other one moves, and then it fixes, and then the other one moves, and then that eye fixes. And what happens is each time you fix on an image, your brain is processing what's in the image to see if it can find what you're looking for. But meanwhile, while it's doing that, the other eye is moving to to lock in on a new image. And it happens in microseconds, like milliseconds, and it's small little like da 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 like that, like small little moves. Well, what happens is when you only have one eye, your one eye has to move, lock, move, lock, move, lock, and it means that your head shakes. So my head shakes when I'm looking for somebody in the middle of a room. Uh, I'll often also involuntarily, like my head tilts to kind of center my right eye to my head. So my head will tilt to the left to bring my right eye more to the center of my body. So my head tilts and shakes when I am in a new space looking for, say, a chair in a, a crowded college classroom or looking for a friend or looking for really anything in a, in a crowded space. When I was in college, this stood out to new people. 
along with the fact that my left eye is a little inward whenever, especially when I'm tired. So like I have a little bit of like a cross-eyed effect and it's significantly worse when I'm tired. So when new people would meet me, my head would shake and whenever they were talking to me, it sometimes looked like I was looking past them as I was talking to them. I've actually had people when I was talking to them, they kind of like stop talking and look behind them to see what I'm looking at. And I'm like, oh, damn. <laughs> like, shit. <laughs> I'm looking at you. <laughs> I know it doesn't look like it, but crap. And man, I tell you what, uh, seeing those reactions made me increasingly more self-conscious about my eye. I began to kind of avoid meeting new people. I had an increasing feeling of self-consciousness and in public and in new situations. It was beginning to make me recluse and quiet, and I lacked confidence. But I reminded myself, I'm not special. Other people have disabilities, and many of them have way more severe and more obvious ones. As uh, God would have it, (laughs) because I doubt it was luck, but as God would have it, at the time, I was working two part-time jobs. Uh, One was doing physical rehab with post-brain trauma patients at UPMC in Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And the other job was a school for disabled students. And I was doing uh, physical education for the disabled students. Here I was worried about my eye when every single day I was working with people who couldn't talk, couldn't walk, couldn't feed themselves, couldn't even go to the bathroom on their own. It really put my eye issue into perspective. It helped me push to continue to be open and be more outgoing and just let who I was as a person shine through the initial oddities that my eye created. The lesson of I'm not special has helped me hundreds of times in my life. When I struggled with something, I am prone to think, you know, woe is me. My life is miserable. I'll never be better. (laughs) I call it being like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Uh, So it's just in that like Eeyore mood. Where just, you know, everything is just doom and gloom. (laughs) And I often have to remind myself that I'm not special. And I feel that a lot of people can get into that mindset as well. When they have something they struggle with, they tend to get into Eeyore mode. (laughs) It's all doom and gloom. You know, you want to lose body fat. You want to build muscle, you want to get stronger, you want to get healthier, but you have a demanding job. You have a demanding job and a family to support. Maybe you have a demanding job, a family to support in financial constraints. Maybe you have a demanding job, a financial uh, family to support, financial constraints, and you're so far removed from being healthy that you think it'll take forever to even make an ounce of a difference. And the list goes on. You look at all of your obstacles and think, there's no way. It's too much. It can't be done. So you continue continue all of your usual habits and you remain unhealthy. Well, when you feel this way, I want you to remember that you are not special. (laughs) feels like I'm insulting you. But again, it's a good thing. When you feel like there's no way, when you feel like it's too much, when you feel like it can't be done, remember, you are not special. Somewhere, someone has overcome what you're struggling with. And, And many have probably dealt with worse. Through 20 plus years of training clients, I have seen people overcome everything. Busy schedules, financial constraints, physical limitations, the list is absolutely endless. Whatever you're struggling with, it can be overcome. The challenge is finding out how. 
with what you know right now, you can't see the how. It truly looks like it can't be done. It truly looks like it's too much. It truly looks like there's no way. The challenge is finding out how. Who has done it or who knows someone who has done it? Can you find a book, a podcast, a YouTube video? Can you, do you know somebody that you can meet in person or meet virtually? Where is the information you want and how do you get it? That's the focus. Whenever I was trying to become less fat and less weak, I read everything. When I first started, it was before internet. So I got as many monthly magazines as I could from Walmart. My mom and dad were amazing. and They took me to Walmart every month so I could get a couple magazines. I read them that night then had to wait another 30 days for more. I bought books whenever you could get them and wherever they were. I remember Arnold's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. I got a lot of other really good books. Uh, Championship Bodybuilding by Chris Aceto. Nutrient Timing was an amazing book. If you've never read that one and you want to learn more about nutrition, that was a great, great book, Nutrient Timing. Uh, I think it's by John Ivey. Uh, Ivey, why? I don't have it in front of me. But I just read everything I could. And then whenever the internet came out, holy crap, that was amazing. I remember finding RX Muscles in the Iron Asylum. Uh, Dave Palumbo had this company where they sold supplements and whatnot. Um, and they had these video interviews of professional bodybuilders. And I remember just looking at them and I'm like, damn, they're the complete opposite of fat and weak. <laughs> There's no fat on them and they're strong as hell. How do they do it? What are they doing? Like, what are they doing? So I would come home from school. I would, I, I forget, because we had dial-up internet. So I think you had to like take the phone off the ringer or, or unplug the phone. Just basically make sure that no one called the house. So I could download a 20-minute video, which took 40 minutes to download. Golly. Uh, so I would watch that video, and then I would skip everything in the night, go downstairs, and train. I was extremely blessed. I mean, beyond words blessed that my parents helped me buy a weight set when I was 16 years old. It was $600 when I was 16, which was like an infinite amount of money at that time. So it was like, you know, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, happy Easter, happy happy everything next year because this is your gift now. And my parents were amazing, but they bought me this adjustable bench that you could do like decline chest press, flat press, incline presses. Uh, it had like uprights that could, could also be used as a squat stand and a dip station on the back side. It had a leg extension, leg curl. We had some old carpet and we just cleared out one side of the two car garage and that became my gym. So I had a gym in the house. It was a 300-pound weight set, which was way more than I needed at that time. I was weak as hell. <laughs> a heavy bag, a heavy boxing bag. I remember I got a speed bag as well. So I used to love to do boxing. Uh, it was just, it was my oasis. It was my little lab. I would go down there and work on things and just experiment and learn and read everything I could in between the sets. I would blast some music like Rocky theme songs. I remember listening to Nickelback, Rockstar, and I just thinking about like wanting to change my life and become something new and something different. It was it was my place that I I found who I was. I found my inner strength. It was an amazing place for me, and it was all thanks to my parents. So thank you, mom and dad, and that's what kind of grew me into who I am today. What. What really set that in motion was the desire to find the answer. Not just sit and think, I'm fat and weak and that's the only way it'll ever be. Instead, I was like, I'm fat and weak and this is absolute bullshit. Absolute bullshit. And there's no way I'm staying this way. So I sought out whatever I could. And that has to become your focus. That has to be an unquenchable thirst. Is to find the answer. Whatever you're struggling with isn't the focus. It's the problem. But it's not the focus. Instead, focus on finding the solution. Don't focus on what you cannot do. 
Focus on finding the solution, finding what you can do. You are not special. Someone, somewhere, knows the answer. Go find it. And in the meantime, be the someone for someone else. This really lit me up and fired me up when I was going through these processes, is to find my own path. As I would struggle to find a resource for the problem, I wanted to become the resource. These two things helped motivate me out of some very dark places in my life. Knowing that I'm not special, that people have overcome what I'm struggling with and and worse. And knowing that if I can find a way out, I can help others do the same. I can help them avoid the same feelings of despair and hopelessness. Whatever you're struggling with, dive into it. Become immersed. Do anything that you already know you should be doing. And do it to the best of your abilities and continue to work on improving your abilities. And in the meantime, seek out more knowledge. Find more answers, more options. If you're proactive, you have hope. Because if you continue to try, change can and will happen. So when you're feeling overwhelmed, when you're feeling there's no way, that it's too much, that it can't be done, I want you to remember, you are not special. But that's a good thing. If you have any questions, if you need anything, reach out through the website, www.brutalironjim.com. On the bottom of the homepage is a contact form. You can send me any questions you have, and I'll help you find some answers. We do have some free information on our website as well for training and nutrition. If you, if you need anything, please let me know. Please reach out. I have been through hell and back in my life. And one of the ways that makes me so grateful for the experiences I have had, good and bad, is that I get to help others avoid the same bad feelings. So if you're struggling, let me know. If you like the podcast, especially today's podcast, consider sharing it. If we share it on social media, it reaches the most amount of people. But even if you just share the podcast in a conversation with people, that helps as well. Just the more people that know about the podcast can then be helped through the podcast. If you like the podcast, please consider donating to support the podcast, which you can do on our website. And if you like the information we share in the podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels. You can find us and follow us on Instagram and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Jim. As always, I hope this was helpful. And thank you for listening.